Welcome to another edition of NASDAQ Spotlight. We are here continuing our live conversations from the Microsoft Ignite Conference in Orlando, Florida. I'm Anna Gonzalez, and now I'm being joined by Richard Harbridge, Chief Technology Officer of 22 Lead. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Uh, so tell me a little bit about 22 Lead. Well, essentially, we're uh, a technology consulting company. We do services in the Microsoft stack, so helping customers essentially make sense of the technology and then apply it in a way that helps the organization. And that could be digital agency stuff. It could be adoption and uh, adoption services, or it could be you know just technology implementation services. Uh, and so, uh, what brings you here to the conference this week? Well, uh, I'm, I'm speaking on a couple subjects at the conference uh, about Office 365 uh, future proofing or strategy. Office 365. Another big part of the discussion at the conference is on social enterprise. So how do we kind of blend the fast-paced, uh, dynamic aspect of teamwork in Microsoft Teams with sort of the enterprise social uh, that is today at least uh, surfaced in most likely Yammer uh, in the Microsoft stack. So I'll be talking about how to blend those, what organizations and our customers are doing successfully there and what's working, and then on the strategy side, you know, how to, I mean, I could simplify it and say you should create a beautiful and amazing effective roadmap, but, you know, there's a lot more to it. So I'll try and give some tactical advice there as well. Yeah, sounds like a good time. Thank you. Um, so what are some of the projects that you're working on outside of this conference uh, that most excite you? Yeah, one of my favorite projects that we're working on right now is essentially a notification hub that works across not just your Office 365 stacks, so like um, Office 365 and, and uh, Dynamics and other things that are very sort of core integration today is via the graph is almost available, but actually integrating with other systems as well inside the enterprise. And then using a layer of AI um, to essentially analyze that information and make suggestions. So a simple example might be, you know, a activity stream of, hey, I uploaded this document, and, you know, you'd be able to go back to find that activity you did is one thing across the stack. But I think a more compelling example would be, I did something, and because we know that you generally, with these people that you just met with, that you worked on this document, you generally share that. Maybe it shouldn't be in your OneDrive or something like that should be in this other place. So trying to help users with sort of the idea concept. We have idea side panel. The idea panel being a, an activity notification view concept. So that's something that I'm excited. It's a bit tactical, but it's, it's pretty interesting with customers. And then we have some other really compelling projects that we're working on as well. A lot of them just push, you know, what we already know is successful is these, these products and suites, Office 365, SharePoint, et cetera. And it really just kind of creates a more cohesive uh, digital workplace experience, whatever that is. In this case, an activity stream experience. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Clippy was ahead of his time. No, that <laughs> was ahead of really his time. was. He was, he was trying to be helpful. Right. He was trying to say like, oh, I think you're doing this, but he didn't have the education, we'll call it, uh, and training That's that um, AI has today. Well, and the problem with Clippy, in a simple nutshell, is Clippy told you things you already knew, and we don't need to do that, right? We can give people that insight if they want to go and experience that. So if you want to go see what you've been doing recently. Even without you know customization, you have that. But you know recommendations are something where you have to have a really compelling reason. You almost right. wait it, and then when the timing is really important too. You know that Clippy wasn't good at timing, and he told you a lot of things you already knew. Right. Yeah. Um, but it'd be great if he came back and he could tell us all sorts of things that That's would right. be helpful. Um, so, uh, how have you seen the industry change over the years? You know, I mean, it's uh, so we're talking about where we are now, right? Beyond Clippy. Um, right. Um, what have you seen in your work? Well, I think uh, there's some big changes, right? So we went from a very, uh, in the technology space, we went from a very technology-centric expertise model to a domain-centric expertise model. So, you know, if, if I look at my own staff that we hire, or I look at customers, what they hire us for, it's still, you know, partly because of technology, but the main benefit that we provide is that domain expertise, how to apply the technology effectively. Less about how to implement it, more about how to apply it. And I think that that shift is very positive overall. It means that uh, as an organizational unit, we've moved from this very um, enablement of productivity experiences to maximizing productivity. And I, I, I fully believe that we're in this the middle of this big productivity push. And once we've maximized productivity, and I do think there is a point where reasonably, you know, we'll still invest there, but it doesn't need to be a critical focus for the organization. They've implemented, um, you know, one of my favorite organizations in the world, uh, 150,000 person plus. They have the Make It, Make It Easier group uh, at the C-level. And essentially what they're trying to do is make things easier, whether it's wow. digital or 
otherwise. Right. And if you take that same idea, once you've established those things, what becomes really compelling is the next step. So if everything's really highly productive, the big step after that isn't you know just the basics of domain expertise, but it's actually maximizing domain expertise, which gets into very creative spaces that you know technology just we don't have the luxury of investing into today. So you know I think we've shifted to productivity, which is great, but more on maximizing. And I think in the near you know decade, let's say we're going to shift hopefully to a maximizing creativity. And I think that personally is where. You know, I'm most excited to see the shift because uh, I've done this productivity thing for a long time and I, I'm happy to see light at the end of the tunnel that we might actually uh, kind of complete the core investments there soon. Well, and I think that's what a lot of industry experts are talking about right now too, right? With automation making our jobs easier, it's supposed to be making more time, and then the job skills that people are really going to be looking for are your complex reasoning and your creativity. And creativity can also fall into creative problem solving, right? Exactly. And being able to take on these concepts. Um, like, how are we going to use blockchain? What is blockchain? How do you describe it? How do you know the technology behind it? Because it could be applied to so many different things to solve problems. Yeah, and I think, you know, personally, I see a lot of people say innovation and creativity is kind of the same thing. Innovation being something, creating something new, is, and that's a hard thing to do. But being creative, it doesn't need to be a hard thing, right? And we see that, like, the more you can take the, the grind, the pain, the annoyances away, the more people actually literally are creative because they're freed up to maximize their time on what makes most organizations more money, which is that creative process, whatever that is, whether it's just applying, you know, a little bit of thought into this presentation to better communicate a subject, right. or whether it's, you know, something much more advanced. That's definitely a future I'm looking forward to. Yes. Uh, so let's shift gears a little to our lightning round. Sure. Uh, so tell me, what is your favorite app, like must-have app? Um, so, personally, I use Microsoft Teams a lot, so it's like indispensable, like Outlook has been historically, um, so those are my two apps. I still am an Outlook junkie, but um, the big thing for us actually is we use Bonusly, which is a, a micro bonus program, it's a social program where, you know, if you've done a great job, I can kind of reward you, and it's silly because it's such a simple concept, but it's been really compelling internally, uh, and as a leader, I find it very helpful to kind of get a sense of where my team's working. The only thing I would say is, it's not really an app, but it's an experience uh, today that I use a lot is uh, my analytics. So that's essentially getting a sense, and I'll be specific. My analytics is interesting, but my specific thing is getting out of touch. So I look at who I've not maybe emailed, uh, phone called, met with for a period of time uh, in our direct staff, or even some of my customers where I'm really close with, and uh, and I reach back out to them. And so it's been a really great tool to kind of be like assistant almost of saying, hey, you know, you got, you've met with these people a lot lately, which is great, but you know, you've really lost touch with this key strategic hire or somebody else, and I'm like, you know, I really should try and take an extra step to, to make some time with them. So that kind of visibility gets me as helpful. So, so I know I said like multiple apps, but... No, that's fantastic. Yeah. And my brain was like, wait, okay, I need to make sure I'm writing all of these down. Uh, don't worry, we'll put in the links for all of these later. Um, going back to Bonusly, yes. is that, are those hard dollars people are giving each other? That's correct. So uh, it's, it's in a point system, so it's a little bit, uh, and this is an important thing because people... So we, we are very generous with bonuses. So it's uh, our, our literally our tagline internally as a company is we're a generous consulting company, which has a whole lot of operational connotations. But one of the big things we do is we really try and be generous to staff. So we have like a vacation, you know, all the typical stuff. Right. One of the things that we do is um, we've been giving really big bonuses, like from an industry standpoint, like double X at least. And we thought that would be a great way to like celebrate it. And what we found uh, when you actually really pull people, and this sounds really counterintuitive, they actually appreciate uh, that little micro bonus of twenty dollars. They don't, you know, because it doesn't make quite the same sense. But they, they appreciate that more sometimes than these bigger bonuses. And the reason for it is because they're getting that not from management; they're getting it from peers. Right. And I think that the second, right. Yeah. And, and the second point is is it's really easy because there's always this opaque layer. When you get a bonus, even with a, a good program, you still kind of don't quite know how that was calculated. You know what I mean? There's right. there's always a little bit of, of um, uh, control from the organization. In this model, it's super transparent how and why you got the bonuses, and I think that that makes it a little bit more valuable to people. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you should do both, but uh, I've been very surprised at how well it's taken up by the organization, and even myself, you know, I've, I've been very lucky in my life, and I'm like, oh, $20 that I get to go spend on some video games or whatever, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, so it's, more coffee, it's, whatever exactly. the case may be. something yeah. nice uh, that I wouldn't normally spend money on because I'm super, you know, budget conscious or something like that. So what's, uh, considering all the things that you're exposed to, what would you say is some of the coolest tech that you have in the office? 
Um, well, we've, we've played with HoloLens quite a bit, um, and that's kind of interesting. I feel like it's a little early, uh, to, to be fair, um, because it, it's while it's interesting and compelling, the experiences just aren't fluid enough, and you know the field of view, etc. Everyone's talked about this stuff, so that's one. But we do use it. Um, we actually try and do remote meetings and stuff using pole portation techniques. We're a remote first organization, which is quite different. So we have a lot of WeWork and, and shared leasing uh, arrangements, and a lot of people who work from home. So for us, um, one of the biggest things that helps us every day is Teams, because we use the, the fact that we can record the meetings, the transcripts are automatically created. There's a lot of this concept of time shifting, uh, which, which is an easy concept. If I have a meeting, we record it, and then I look at it later, I can do that faster, right? I can kind of speed through sections, I can figure out if it applies to me. That is a big ROI benefit to organizations. For us, because we are remote, almost all of our value is in time shifting a lot of the time. And so we get a huge, enormous boon from a little enhancement like auto transcripts because it allows us to jump to that section of the video that's relevant and then get out of that video of that meeting recording, right? And so um, so that's been really, like, uh, it's, it's been a game changer in terms of productivity for our organization. Um, so I would say, you know, if anything, it would be Microsoft Teams and specifically some of those innovations that have driven a lot for us. Uh, and, I, and it's so funny, this, this round is supposed to be to go quickly, but now I have to go back and ask, with HoloLens, so since you have teams that are all remote, so does everybody just put on glasses and you see each other in the meeting? So we have uh, two at two, we were like two remote locations um, that we've tried that with. At the end of the day, most of the time, uh, like I said, it's, it's more of like a, a tool to play with. Uh, yeah. we, we thought we would use a little bit more. Again, it's, it's just too limiting in the prototype stage. Now, we've worked with customers and implemented it in like, um, you know, if you're purchasing a design studio type environment, it's very expensive to create physical, um, you know, I slide out this floor and here's that floor for your, you know, custom right. condo or apartment or whatever, and here's a different floor. You know, it's nicer to be able to do some digital examples of that, especially collaboratively between like, say, a husband and wife or somebody who's doing the shopping. So there's things we've done, uh, whether it's lab environments or other things where the whole lens is really helpful, but for you know, uh, I'll get in trouble for this, but for meetings, I think it's just too early uh, in terms of adoption. It's it's a bit bulky, it's expensive, and the experiences aren't really what you want. Teams is where it's at, and then, you know, uh, we saw some compelling experiences uh, for those who watched the keynote here at Ignite, where they've shown some features uh, for teams and meetings, and I think that as HoloLens becomes a little bit more integrated in that experience in the team uh, room, in the meeting room environment, then I think it's going I don't think uh, anytime soon users, you, me, whoever is going to wear HoloLens at home, I think it's more for those um, meeting room environments. It's a, another tool just like the webcam in the meeting room is. Yeah, well, I think that's a, a fair assessment because it's it's interesting to be in um, on the cutting edge and seeing where it is now and just knowing where how it could potentially develop exactly. and um, people would adapt to it. So uh, what do you like to do when you're not working? Um, I have a uh, two-year-old uh, as of next month, and I have another one on the way. So, oh, congratulations. Uh, yes. Yeah. So essentially juggling them and, and just uh, enjoying some time at home. That's my preference. So. Yeah. Uh, so, Richard, as we start to wrap up here, um, if someone's watching this and they think, Richard has a really cool job, I hope to one day be in his position, uh, what advice do you have for the future generation coming up? Yeah, I think I think there's, uh, you know, everyone says, you know, follow your passion. I think Honestly, I think a lot of people don't understand that your passion doesn't mean it's easy. And, you know, uh, passio, like the origin of passion, actually means to suffer. So it's the you know, passion of Christ, passion. So if you think about it as the key of passion is you, you have to do it because it just it feels right. It's the thing you need to do. It's important to you. Um, to understand that, that that's going to take a toll on you, whether it's emotional, whether it's effort. And I think, you know, uh, for myself, what's really helped me is I've been really good about when I'm going to invest in passion, that I really have an idea of not just one way of paying that value off, but multiple patterns. And when we look at technology, a lot of times we can get stuck in, oh, I need to ramp up on Azure, or I need to ramp up on this new thing. And a lot of times what it really is, is you have to think about, like, what is this going to do for me? And it, in what is my passion that underlies this? And it's okay if you don't know that answer, right? It's just work towards it. Don't give up, you know, on, on exploring that. And if you're ever in a situation where you feel, this is easy, I'm doing great, switch and take a harder job. Because uh, the only way you're going to grow is if you're challenged. Those are great words to wrap up on. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. And thank you all for watching. Stay tuned for more conversations right here from Microsoft Ignite.